Imagine traveling to the most remote part of our planet, Antarctica, the last great wilderness. Despite the eternal ice, humans have made their mark here, and in doing so, have made history. 70% of the world's fresh water is held here in the ice. On board the World Discoverer, we can take you into a world that most of us can only dream of visiting. The human stamp on the landscape bears traces of great explorers like Amundsen, Scott and Shackleton. Keeping their memories alive, the adventurers of today are dedicated scientists, probing the ice for answers or striving to protect this remote wilderness. Antarctica is the travel destination to beat them all. Come aboard for an unforgettable journey. This is one of the few places on Earth where the sounds of the modern world are completely absent. The only people here are scientists and travelers, making up a population of around a thousand in the summer, even fewer in winter. Only specially adapted vessels can make the journey. Among the fleet of Antarctic ships is our trusty vessel, the World Discoverer. She relies on the steady hand of Captain Thomas Ruder to manoeuvre her 108 metre long, 6,000 tonnes of steel through the field of thick pack ice. The ice cap is, on average, 2,000 metres thick and covers an area twice the size of Australia. Norwegian Roald Amundsen was the first to reach the South Pole and summed up this inhuman world. Glittering white, shining blue, jet black. In sunlight, the country shines like a fairy tale. Summit to summit, passed through by glaciers as wild as no other country on our globe. There is Antarctica, undiscovered and undisturbed. Very cold air contains little water vapour to create snow. This is why the interior of Antarctica is the world's biggest desert with precipitation averaging under five centimetres per year. In 1773, Captain James Cook crossed the Antarctic seas, proving once and for all that a southern continent did exist and opening up the way for explorers. Today, on board the Discoverer, we retrace the first footsteps. Starting in Chile, we will sail past the Falkland Islands to South Georgia and then on, going further still to the South Orkney Islands before finally reaching the Antarctic Peninsula. Geophysicist Jeff Renner is one of the most renowned researchers of the British Antarctic Survey. He even had the honour of lending his name to an Antarctic mountain, Renner's Peak, and was awarded the Polar Medal by Queen Elizabeth II for his contributions to science. Jeff spends his whole life travelling back and forth between Europe and the Southern Ice. He lectures on board the World Discoverer. 
our first history of Antarctic is one of commerce, it's one of economics, where the sealers came, came down, for the fur seals primarily, latterly for the elephant seals. But following that, then there was what I would call the continental penetration, the search for the pole, the, the Amundsen, the Scott, the Shackleton, names which are synonymous with Antarctic uh, exploration. Following that again, we had the economics of the Antarctic, we had the whaling. But maybe 1944-45, uh, then, then we had the, the, the beginnings of the science. I'll say in a way the political era also, which developed into the Antarctic Treaty. This agreement came at the 11th hour, finally offering protection to the depleted wildlife of Antarctica. By the time the Antarctic Treaty came into force in 1961, most of the animals in this icy region were already dangerously close to extinction. With help, nature almost always bounces back, and today the numbers of seals and penguins are again building to their former strengths. King penguins have a unique breeding cycle that lasts 16 months from courtship to fledging a chick. For the first 54 days, the male does all the incubating, but once the chick has hatched, both parents share the burden. To meet the youngster's demands, doting parents will need to hunt fish over several kilometers of ocean, where they dive with ease to depths of 300 meters to hunt in the ocean depths. The begging chicks then persuade their parents to regurgitate their hard-earned catch. Older chicks gather in creches to wait for their parents' return. Cold winds can reach up to 300 kilometers per hour here, making chicks huddle together. Homemade central heating. The cacophony of parents trying to identify their chicks' calls in the throng can be heard throughout the island. In the chaos, it's not unusual for a chick to try and attach itself to the wrong parent. The chicks are born naked, but quickly grow a thick coat of brown down with inbuilt super insulation. At around 14 months old, they begin to shed their dull baby suits and start to look more like their parents. Slowly, itchy down gives way to the rich, regal markings that give the king penguin its name. Adult males and females share the same design, making them difficult to distinguish. There is more to the fancy feathers than showing off. Penguins have three or four times more feathers than other birds, over 30 for every square centimeter. This is nature's dry suit. The tip of each feather is tough and scaly to avoid them being compressed underwater, maintaining the penguin's hydrodynamic shape. It is only when the young birds have their adult outfits that they are ready to take to the sea. penguins have some colossal neighbors. Elephant seals suffered at the hands of man even more than the penguin. 
When whale stocks were exhausted, hunters turned their attention to the oil-rich seals. Thousands of them fell to greed. Protected today, they lie contentedly on the beach. Each enormous male can weigh up to four tons. They look cumbersome on land because they're built for swimming and are among the deepest divers in nature, foraging at depths of over a kilometer. Only the largest 2% of males gain the right to hold a harem, sometimes with as many as 100 females. It's usually enough for the beachmasters to use their intimidating size to ward off lower-ranking bulls. Clemens Putz is the leader of the World Discoverer expedition. His number one passion is penguins. Sometimes he gets so caught up in his research that he forgets to watch his back. And these are not neighbors you'd want to fall out with. In contrast to the adults, Pups are harmless balls of blubber. Elephant seal milk is the richest in the animal kingdom, and the pups quadruple their weight within weeks, producing thick, flabby jackets to keep them warm. Despite legal protection, there are still inevitable casualties. Death is a frequent visitor to Gold Harbor. An emaciated pup lies feebly on the beach. His mother probably never returned from a fishing trip. It's only a matter of time before the scavenging skewers move in. Thankfully, numbers are steadily growing. And they're not the only marine mammal enjoying a comeback. With agility that belies its size, the humpback whale is once again a common sight during the summer months. It is believed that once 150,000 humpback whales swam the oceans. Now, only 28,000 remain. The blue whales suffered most, as hunters reduced their numbers to just 1%. Today, there is still no sign of recovery. The first men to explore these freezing waters were seal hunters and whalers. By the 1800s, the world had developed a great thirst for whale oil, which fueled industry, lit lamps, and was used to make cosmetics and candles. Giant slaughterhouses were set up, abattoirs for the greatest animals that have ever lived. An assembly line dissected the bodies. Oil cookers smoldered constantly, melting oil from the blubber but leaving the rest of the whale unused. Two million whales were killed. The population was exhausted and the business no longer became profitable. Eventually, all that was left were the vast skeletons of processing plants, rotting reminders of the whale's fate. The hunting reached its peak in the beginning of the 20th century when steamships improved the odds of the chase and even the fastest whales could be run down. Today, ghostly remains still litter the beaches. The whale 
bones we see around here really are an indication of the early whaling industry, where the whole carcass was not used. Instead, the choice blubber, blubber was taken, uh, and uh, the, the meat and the remains were cast ashore. The journey continues onwards to Deception Island. Maintaining 15 knots, the world discoverer and its passengers must endure the fury of the southern seas. Corridors and lounges become quiet as the eight-meter waves force many of the seasick guests to their cabins. Deception Island lies 120 kilometers north of the Antarctic Peninsula. Once inside the bay entrance, known as Neptune's Bellows, Jeff uses a Zodiac craft to make landfall to explore more of the whaler's legacy. With a broad, shallow bay, this was an ideal location for a whale processing plant. The huge 12-meter tanks once stored the whale oil before it was exported north. Their vastness gives a good impression of the scale of the slaughter and of how lucrative the trading of dead whales had become. that a Norwegian immigrant to Chile sought license to carry out to whaling in Deception Island. And initially for about five years, they used floating factory ships just offshore here. However, in 1911, uh, permission was granted uh, to build an onshore whaling station, Hector Whaling Station, uh, which, which we're uh, at now. It was a fairly lucrative business until 1931, when the price of whale oil slumped and the whaling station was vacated. Here we are in one of the uh, old, large uh, whaling, whaling storage uh, tanks. Now, of course, uh, it is empty and the wind and weather are now eroding man's presence on this island. The fifth largest continent in the world, conditions here are too extreme to support indigenous human populations. But over the course of 200 years, the region has been home to Europeans, Russians and Americans. You don't even need a visa to travel here, although bad weather can often mean pulling into a port of another country for shelter. Jeff has some fond memories of this place. For a while, this hut was home. This hut is a hut which in 1965, certainly on my first visit here, was an active hut. It was a base. Perhaps some of the coal which is in the back here I, I actually carried in myself. It's an old whaler's hut. It was probably an accommodation block. But in 1969, a volcanic fissure opened. And from that fissure, there was an ice flow, a mud flow, and it swept through and destroyed the hut. And in so doing, it destroyed much of the whaling station. It extended the coastline here by some 100 meters. Again, it's nature and it's man trying to combat nature. Next door is Antarctica's oldest aircraft hangar. Erected in 1962, it gave expeditions their first opportunity to explore from the air. There's even the corpse of a plane that was beaten by Antarctic gales and crash landed in 1967. In its heyday, it worked for the British Antarctic Survey the same organization that continues to support Jeff's work to this day. Back on board the World Discoverer, our journey continues. 
With no deep harbors, every trip to shore has to be on the Zodiac. Vicken on the east coast of South Georgia, the oldest whaling station, founded in 1904. It ran until 1964. Gritvicken was one of the biggest catching stations. Employing around 300 men, it could completely process a 20 meter whale in just two hours. It's now playground to boisterous young seals. The 500 resident working men and their wives, the only women allowed on the island at the time, made Gritviken the capital of the Antarctic. It even had its own cinema and bar. It was the launch point for most hunting and research expeditions. A proud fleet, now chained to history. A little church stands above the town. Here, whalers could pray for remission of their sins. If their sins were environmental, then the prayers were in vain. Today, a troop of specialist cleaners have been drafted in to clear up their asbestos leftovers. The cleanup has been initiated by the government of South Georgia, a 10 million pound operation to make the area safe for visitors and wildlife alike. Because of enclosing pack ice, the Antarctic is out of bounds to ships for the winter. Only in the Antarctic summer, from November to March, do the ice fields yield a passage. However, these changes in ice are far from predictable. The path doesn't always open, something that has spelt doom to many travelers in the past. One Norwegian managed to overcome the dangers. Roald Amundsen became the first man to reach the South Pole. To bypass the ice fields, Amundsen relied mainly on fleets of dog sledges. The resistant animals led his men to success, even providing a few desperate meals along the way. On December the 14th, 1911, after 99 days, the expedition reached the pole just a month before Scott's team arrived. This race to the South Pole has become legendary. Scott and his men died on their way back. A tragic end to their defeated trip. Even Sir Ernest Shackleton, probably the most famous of a long and distinguished line of British polar researchers, met with disaster in this icy realm. Like so many, he lost his heart to Antarctica, and when he died in 1922, he was buried here at Gritviken. Sir Ernest Shackleton is synonymous with polar exploration and particularly with the heroic age of Antarctic uh, exploration. And anyone who has read about Shackleton will know that above all polar survival stories is that of the endurance. In 1914, Shackleton wanted to be the first person to cross Antarctica. But just two days after setting off, thick pack ice brought the expedition to a standstill. He then made a fatal decision to sit out the storm. His team were trapped in the Weddell Sea for the entire winter, exposed to temperatures of minus 80 degrees. 
Enormous icebergs drifted past the ships, some of them the size of small countries. It must have been terrifying for the men, especially as the Titanic had sunk only two years before. Unlike that great ship, the Endurance was made of wood and had to cope with giant icebergs on a daily basis. Even today, icebergs remain the ultimate navigational challenge. What appear as tiny, benign pricks of green on the discoverer's radar are every seaman's nightmare. A strike could have fatal consequences. Banks of dials looking like the controls of a spaceship are the discoverer's key to survival, helping to navigate through the lethal fields of ice. Chief Engineer Jürgen has spent decades at sea servicing vessels, but despite his experience, he still feels great respect for the Weddell Sea. I've worked at sea for 40 years, but it took 30 of those before I finally fulfilled my dreams and made it to Antarctica. I have to keep all of the equipment running smoothly. One of the greatest challenges comes from the temperature. So far we've managed to keep everything going and I always look forward to whatever challenges come next. In the same area, 90 years before, the Endurance didn't manage the pack ice finally overpowered their wooden hull. The team was stranded on the shelf edge, more than 1,600 kilometers from the nearest civilization. On November the 21st, 1915, one year after the expedition began, the Endurance sank. Miraculously, the men survived five months on the ice shelf. When finally the ice retreated, they took to the water in small lifeboats. Their landing was hampered by huge breakers that smashed against the shores. On making landfall, their relief was intense. For the first time in one and a half years, they felt solid ground beneath their feet. This was Elephant Island. Today, weather conditions that Shackleton's team could only have dreamed of greet the discoverer as she anchors close to Elephant Island. Blue skies, calm seas and sunshine. A far cry from the horror of the endurance. In a robust zodiac, Jeff can tour in relative safety. This watercourse was christened Cape Wild in honor of Shackleton's struggles. Like those brave men, Jeff must seek out a route through submerged rocks and ice, but with good weather and a powerful motor on his side, there isn't much of a problem. Rather than intimidating, the ice provides an awesome spectacle of nature's power. This is Point Wild on Elephant Island, and it is this spot, this exact spot, where 22 men from Shuttle's Endurance Expedition survived for 128 days. Finally, it was the boat called the Yell Show, captained by Pilota Louis Pardo, who made it. This is a statue which we see behind him, and with that ended perhaps the greatest of all polar survival stories. There were two things that saved the men. Firstly, landfall finally brought them fresh food in the form of penguins. The starving men were able to restock. Secondly, a brave act from their captain himself. Shackleton set off with five fellow crew members on a life-risking trip to get help. The chin-strapped penguins take little notice of Jeff. This same colony saved those shipwrecked lives, providing meat and fuel. It was a lucky break for sailors struggling to survive.
On the tiny life raft, the James Caird, Shackleton and his volunteers left their fellows and set off into terrifying seas, whipped by hurricane winds into an icy frenzy. Equipped with only the most primitive navigational tools, the fact that they made it to South Georgia at all is something of a miracle. The crossing is often credited as one of the greatest nautical achievements of all time. The boat and crew landed in one piece, but had arrived on the wrong side of the island. So near and yet so far. After all he had been through, Shackleton now had to negotiate the 3,000 meter summit to reach civilization on the other side. And finally, the whaling port of Stromness came into sight. A ghost town is all that remains of this once thriving whaler's port. And was it in Stromness Bay, this very bay, and behind me, which we can see, the manager's house, where Shackleton, Crean and Wordsley finally made a destination after 36 epic hours, crossing for the first time the island of South Georgia. Shackleton later wrote of the mission, We were full of memories. We suffered, we starved, and we celebrated victory. We were crawling on hands and feet, and still we were reaching for the skies. We had been growing because of the greatness of things. We had seen God in all his glory, had listened to the text which nature itself writes. We had reached the naked soul of man. A cross stands on South Georgia in honor of Shackleton, built by members of the expedition after their rescue. They left one other special tribute. When Sir Ernest Shackleton returned to the Antarctic for the fourth time on the MV Quest, sad to say it was his last time. And in the bay behind us, Cumberland Bay, it was the bay in which he died on January the 5th, 1922. This is the cross erected by the men of the Quest to Shackleton. They left a photographic record. There is the men of the Quest, there is the photograph, and there are all of their names, their signatures. Two of the most famous on these, and there are several from the Endurance Expedition, are Frank Wilde and Frank Worsley. The heroic age of Amundsen, Scott and Shackleton are long gone. But the legacy of their adventure continues. The great pioneers paved the way, but their heirs travel in greater comfort and safety today. One thing stays the same. They're driven by the spirit of discovery, and a trip to Antarctica remains one of the world's ultimate journeys. Our voyage now takes us west of South Georgia. Halfway to the Antarctic Peninsula lie the Orkney Islands, World Discoverer heads for Lorry Island. Lorry is the smaller of the two main islands, around 20 kilometers long. Like a giant skeleton, the islands lie exposed from the sea, with a central spine radiating into a number of precipitous ridges. These peninsulas create sheltered bays, where the steep cliff edges of glaciers crumble into the sea. Eventually, the colours of a polar station called Orkadath, founded by the Scottish, glow out of the snowy whiteness. William Spears Bruce was an oceanographer, but he brought with him a biologist, a zoologist, a geologist, a taxidermist, and in fact his own bagpiper. But perhaps what is more significant is that when he left, he offered the base to the Argentinians, and they were only too grateful to make a footing, a first footing in the Antarctic continent. And as I say, it has been here for over a hundred years now, a continuous scientific occupation. And that, in the long term, I think will have political significance. Because nobody owns Antarctica, the continent has long been at the heart of international disputes over land and fishing rights. Every nation wants to maintain a presence. To date, 42 stations are operated by 17 countries.
the pristine polar continent is also used as an excellent indicator of the state of the planet. Stefan Kredel, another geologist on board the World Discoverer, visits the manager of Orkadath Station. Having spent the winter alone, the team is pleased to welcome visitors. The first stop on the tour? The pantry, the most important room of any ice station. Supplying a team with food in the Antarctic is an enormous logistic challenge that no technology could change. Getting it wrong could cost lives. At the moment, there is still a plentiful supply of sausages at the Orkadath, although fruit and veg have been low on the ground for months. Stefan is invited into the main house for a local speciality, a reviving cup of Argentinian tea. The priority at tea time is an exchange of news, and the conversation is dominated by Antarctic talk. When will the next ship arrive? How severe was the winter? When did the sea ice break up? Stefan sets out to explore the day-to-day -day living of people at the station. At this particular base, life is comparatively comfortable. The apartments even come with their own communal gym. It may seem strange to work on a great body at the lonely end of the world. But the men welcome the exercise and pump iron to their heart's content. If you spend winter in the Antarctic, it's very important to work out so that even under these conditions, your body remains fit and healthy. To be healthy in spirit, as well as body, a chapel is installed next door. Orkadath is like a small village on ice, with fewer than two dozen inhabitants. Some of the workers here remember a recent earthquake. This particular one measured seven on the Richter scale. Luckily, the buildings themselves are designed to withstand such tremors. Incidents like these emphasize the importance of the radio operators. As a leaving gift, Stefan offers fresh fruit from the ship, perhaps the nicest gift he could present to this isolated community. And mutual and heartfelt farewells are exchanged before the journey commences. Next destination on our whistle-stop tour of Antarctica, the Polish station of Arktoski, situated on the South Shetland Islands, where he's shown the ropes by Marta, a colleague from Warsaw, on her daily rounds. Now that expedition cruisers make frequent visits, the various polar scientists are able to work much more closely together and welcome the chance to discuss their varied projects and ideas with fellows in their fields. Out on the ice, there is no political border and national secrets. Only science. Marta shows Stefan around her laboratory. The focus of her studies is the effects and levels of pollutants on Antarctica. Even though the nearest factory lies a thousand kilometers away, the pollution is carried by wind and waves and is dumped on the ice. Monitoring the long-term effects of this waste is vital. Antarctica is a landscape that can only regenerate very slowly. One small change could spell disaster.
our journey continues. And now, as the voyage nears its end, we head north again, entering once more the foreboding magnificence of Deception Island. The vast rolling hills of ice create a fortress around the island. But in a few small areas of coast, it gives way to beaches, prime spots for penguin lovers. This is a penguin highway, an endless trek of birds, in this case chinstraps, going to or from the sea or their nest sites. The world discoverer's resident zoologist, Clemens Putz, makes a routine checkup of the colony. Tens of thousands of pairs have assembled to breed. The animals are sitting here and waiting for the snow to melt, so they try to build a nest. Actually, they're just pressing small pits in the snow, and you can't nest in that. There are many animals coming home from fishing trips. They feed mainly on crayfish and will dive quite deep, up to 150 meters to catch them. Penguins return year after year to the same beach from which they hatched. They will use the same spot to breed for their entire lives. Mating is a sensitive affair and seems to leave both parties exhausted. Soon they will take turns sheltering their egg. Birds can nest in peace, no longer in fear of human hunters. Thankfully, that dark age of exploitation is over. The times of trying to conquer this wilderness have long gone, replaced today with a desire to protect it. After exploration and exploitation, a third chapter in the history of Antarctica has begun. A time of wonder. Who knows what the future will bring? The Antarctic Treaty laid the foundation. It was a gentleman's agreement. and it was, a, it was a good agreement. It was an agreement of trust. But subsequent to that, there have been various uh, protocols, recommendations, conventions, which have introduced to protect the seals, the fauna and the flora, uh, the seal, the sea mammals, and also the environment itself. A gentleman's agreement turned treaty is working well. Tourism is carefully regulated, hunting is banned, and mining prohibited. Antarctica is being restored to a magical realm of ice, and it is still the most remote and pristine landscape on Earth. With continued protection, this dramatic wilderness will inspire generations to come.